Okay, I think we're going to jump in. Um, I'm Peter Markowitz. I'm a professor here at Cardozo, and I direct the Catherine O. Greenberg Immigration Justice Clinic. And issues of due process and access to justice for immigrants and more generally are near and dear to the heart of the Cardozo community, so we're quite honored to be hosting this event today. Um, and I want to start by thanking the co-hosting organizations together with the clinic, the Center for Migration Studies, uh, Fragman Worldwide, and the Freed Frank Law Firm have uh, pulled this together. Um, I also want to thank all of you who got here on this uh, still very snowy day, and particularly uh, the panelists who came from afar in adverse travel conditions. Um, I also want to uh, single out Corrine Shannon, who's been very much the glue that's kind of held this uh, together and really appreciate her support through this. It is uh, an extremely kind of timely and exciting time to be taking stock of what we've accomplished and of the work that remains to be done in ensuring due process and access to justice for all immigrants. In many ways, it's uh, the gravest of times for our immigrant communities. With the rhetoric in the national discourse on immigration kind of echoing some of the worst episodes of xenophobia in our nation's history, with women and children fleeing brutal violence in Central America only to be met with an equally brutal detention and deportation system here in the United States, and with immigrant communities very much under siege from a relentless wave of home and community raids. And finally, with the only really significant federal achievement advancement stepped forward on immigration over the last period of time, the DACA and DAPA programs hanging in the balance and awaiting judgment from Justice Kennedy and his colleagues. It's in this context that we meet and think about how to move our justice system forward for immigrants. But it's equally important to take stock of what we've achieved as a community. And locally, the achievements have been quite substantial. Five years ago, New York City funneled three to 4,000 people per year from our criminal justice system into immigration detention. This year, that number is going to be about 20, 2 zero, and that's progress. Five years ago, immigrants detained New Yorkers who were detained in the immigration justice system. Two-thirds of them were shipped to far-off detention facilities thousands of miles away, many in Texas and Louisiana, where they lacked access to counsel, to families, to witnesses, to every tool they needed for a fair outcome. And this year, virtually every New Yorker will have the opportunity to have their hearings here in New York City. Five years ago, 60 to 80 percent of detained New Yorkers had no counsel whatsoever. Right? They had to litigate in one of the most complex arenas of law against trained government attorneys with the gravest of consequences hanging over their heads without a lawyer to help them. And 20 percent of non-detained immigrants in New York City faced the same fate and thousands more lacked access to legal assistance to help them with affirmative benefits in the immigration realm. But over the last two years, we have seen a substantial and much needed infusion of $30 million, approximately $30 million over the last two years of private and public dollars, particular thank yous to Speaker Mark Viverito and, and Mayor de Blasio for making that happen, um, to improve access to justice for immigrants. And as a result, those 60 to 80 percent of detained immigrants that lacked access to counsel, this year that number is zero. We're the first jurisdiction in the nation to have a working public defender system for detained immigrants and the only jurisdiction to be able to say no family in New York will be torn apart ever again simply because they can't afford an attorney. Right. And, sim <laughs> and similar progress has been made for non-detained immigrants and for people seeking to apply for affirmative benefits. So we have come a very long way, but there is a very long way to go and much work to be done. And we're going to get to that work in just a moment with our first panel on detention. But before we do, I just wanted to introduce someone who has really been at the fore of the struggle for due process and access to justice for immigrants for quite some time, the executive director of the Center for Migration Studies, Donald Kerwin. Thank you very much, Peter. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, 
Let me, let me do the thank yous to start off with, and first of all, thanking Peter Markowitz and Cardozo um, Law School for hosting us. This is a great place to be because it's you know, geographically a terrific place, but also because of Peter's really important work and the law clinic's important work on detention and due process over so many years now. Um, let me thank our other co-sponsors as well. The law firms of Fried Frank and Fragaman worldwide, thank you very much. And in particular, thank you to Karen Grise and to um, Austin Fragaman, who are two CMS board members, and to Corrine Shannon from Fragaman, who's sitting in the first row, who's been really instrumental in kind of conceptualizing and structure, structuring this event. So thank you. It's very nice to be here with people who, in their own way, have been terrific leaders on all of these issues that we're going to consider and discuss today. I wanted to thank the panelists, particularly those who traveled from outside New York. We did lose a couple, you know, we did lose a couple in transit, but uh, we have some new additions to our agenda, and they're both stars in the field, at least two that I know about, Judy Rabinovitz and, um, and Michelle Pistone, and there may be one or two others. So thank you for, uh, for, for um, agreeing to speak at the drop of a hat here. And thanks finally uh, to CMS staff, to Rachel Reyes, who's our communications director and sitting in the front row there, Daniela Alulema, Reese Johnson, Kyle Barron, Catherine Darkle, and all the, all the great people that have helped um, staff this event today. So what's this conference about? Well, for me, it goes back a long way, 216 years, to a quote from James Madison, which I particularly like, and he said, the banishment of an alien from a country where he may have formed the most tender of connections, where he may have vested his entire property, is among the severest of punishments. Our event today is about the rights and procedures of people who face that very severe punishment, although our law, of course, doesn't treat it as a, as a crime, but it has the same effects. And we'll be discussing today what can be barriers to due process, like the use of detention and the growing problem of non-court removals. But as Peter mentioned, we have some good news, too, about the terrific progress being made in New York in this area and elsewhere on legal counsel issues and on other due process issues, and with a particular focus on the representation of unaccompanied children. Let me also briefly mention um, that access to justice for immigrants goes well beyond the removal adjudication process in the court system. In fact, there's a substantial population of unauthorized immigrants out there in the U.S. who qualify for legal status uh, but, either, but don't know it or haven't pursued it because of lack of legal assistance. We're quite convinced of that, having uh, done a study involving 80 different uh, agencies that represent DACA and DAPA recipients, that there's a large population who could legalize now if they had legal counsel. The Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, Advancing Justice, National Immigration Justice Center, and others um, have begun to document this dramatic fact as well. In any event, that's a kind of an aside. We have a very important day before us, and I wanted to thank all of you um, for being here, braving the weather. You're New Yorkers, right? So you're tough. This is nothing. I'm, I'm coming up from Washington, so this is a big deal for somebody like me. I'm, I'm kind of one of those soft Washington guys. Um, but let me turn to, uh, I'm, I'm supposed to be talking on and on because we don't know if, the two, if two of our panelists are here. They are here. Okay. Let me turn now to Karen Grise to moderate our first panel. And thank you, Peter. Thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. Give us a second here to get ourselves arranged, and then we'll uh, get started for you. I can't tell you that um, only I am happier than Don um, <laughs> to see that everybody made it on time. I, I know that um, either one of us, Don or I, could very easily fill the talk on and on um, model, but I'm happy that we don't have to do that, and we'll, um, we'll uh, move as quickly as we can to the meat of the panel here. Um, I'll echo the thanks to everybody for um, traveling from wherever and for being here for this big day. Uh, I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Karen Grise. I head the pro bono program in Freed Frank's Washington, D.C. office. 
and also serve um, the ABA, AILA, and a number of other organizations on policy-related immigration work and do a lot of uh, direct representation myself in asylum and other um, other immigrated, immigration related applications or forms of relief. So I'm delighted to be able to present to you this opening panel this morning on detention. I wanted to tell you a bit about what we have in mind as the um, model and framework for the panel and then get right to it. Um, we plan to have the three presenters that you see before you speaking for about 20 minutes each. I'm going to make very short introductions of them with some of the um, points that are most uh, relevant for purposes of this particular panel, but I want to tell you that I'm not doing justice to their complete bios and refer you to those fuller bios that are at the back of your agenda packet so you'll have the chance to read about everybody's um, uh, earlier history, education, and some of those things that I won't take time to touch on. So the idea is 20 minutes each, roughly, I'd like you to hold your questions, note your questions, but hold them until the end. I'm concerned about the amount of material that we have to cover and our ability to do it in the time that we have, but I will hold some time at the end for Q&A, so ask you to hold on to your questions and then raise them at that time at the end. Um, so uh, the scope of the panel, we're going to be speaking, as you see from the title, about detention, generally, detention in the context of due process, and I'm sure an issue that everybody's concerned about right now is family detention in particular. So to the extent that you're focused on that, um, uh, don't despair. We will get to family detention, but we are going to give you a frame that includes detention as a whole and talk about um, some of the policy issues there as well as um, the particular due process issues that are of concern on the family detention topic. So the idea is we're going to talk about some uh, history of the policy, policy developments, uh, human rights issues, and legal issues related to uh, due process in the detention context, and then at the end, um, uh, talk in particular about some of the litigation challenges to detention and family detention historically, where they are now, and what are the things to watch in the coming period. Um, so here are the quick bios for you. Um, to my immediate right, Dr. Dora Schrero. Dora serves as the Commissioner of the Com Connecticut Department of Emergency Services and Protection right now. Um, but um, for purposes of this panel, her uh, well-earned chops, as you know, are um, in the corrections area. Dora started out as the... Um, I shouldn't say started out, that's not true, but came, came in the into prominence in the immigration-related area when she came to serve under Secretary Janet Napolitano um, as a, um, tell me, special advisor? Yeah, that's a, I thought I could manage to come up with it somewhere. A special advisor um, in the Department of Homeland Security, but prior to that, she had served when um, Napolitano was governor of Arizona as the director of corrections there. Before that, she served a similar role in St. Louis City Department of Corrections, and then subsequently, after her time at ICE, in the New York City Department of Corrections. The um, relevant point, I think, for today is under Secretary Napolitano, Dr. Schreiro served as the first director of ICE's Office of Detention Policy and Planning, and in that capacity, although she was with ICE a relatively short period of time, wrote a really pivotal, critical report making recommendations for detention reform at ICE, and um, we'll be hearing a bit about what those were then, what's happened, and which of those recommendations are still uh, in need of implementation today. Now, although Dora's now in Connecticut, she is continuing her work on immigration detention-related issues. She serves on the ABA Commission on Immigration and was one of the principal authors of the ABA's recent report. I have here uh, now the Family Immigration Detention, Why the Past Cannot Be Prologue, hearkening back to the report that she did during her time at ICE. And um, she's also recently appointed to the um, committee constituted by ICE, the Advisory Committee on Family Residential Centers, and maybe we'll hear a bit 
about that entity and her role there. Um, uh, second, at my far right, is Eleanor Acer, the Senior Director of Refugee Protection Program at Human Rights First here in New York. Um, probably everyone in this room knows Eleanor, but she oversees Human Rights First's pro bono representation pro program and handles their advocacy on issues related to refugee protection, asylum, and migrants' rights. Um, Eleanor has been a prolific writer and speaker on these issues and similarly has testified before Congress on these issues as well. She played a lead role in the um, preparation of Human Rights First recent report, uh, family detention, still happening, still damaging, so you'll start to see a theme emerging here. Um, and uh, Eleanor is a constant advocate, advocate in policy circles as well as for pro bono representation for asylum seekers. She serves currently on the advisory committee of the ABA Commission on Immigration, and she'll be giving you remarks about detention and family, con um, family detention from a human rights perspective in particular. Um, and last but not least, um, what I'm going to say is, if not the if not the star of the panel, the certainly one that gets the most kudos from us for being here, um, Judy Rabinovitz, the Deputy Director and Director of Detention and Federal Enforcement Programs for the ACLU Immigrants' Rights Project, is one of the people Don referenced who stepped in at the last minute to replace uh, someone who was uh, waylaid by travel. And um, we're eminently grateful to Judy for her willingness to do all this work and prepare just literally over the course of the weekend. Uh, Judy, at <laughs> no, I have confidence. My history with Judy is long enough to know we won't be disappointed. Uh, Judy litigates class action and impact cases on a variety of issues affecting the rights of detained immigrants, especially um, focused on policies and practice around detention as well as immigration more generally. She's been an adjunct professor at NYU for about 19 years now, and some of her uh, key cases in which she has personal involvement is the Zadvitis case about indefinite detention, would be Reno way back around the 96 time frame, uh, challenging the implementation of IRIRA. She argued Demore v. Kim versus, uh, in front of versus, it was kind of versus, in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, most recently on family detention has been involved in the RILR versus Johnson, and she'll be talking a bit about that. Um, I do want to say that we attempted to have a government speaker on this panel, and we really hoped to have the government perspective on detention and family detention, but um, the, uh, government was unable to accept the invitation, so I just want to be clear that we wanted to have that perspective and unfortunately we just don't. So um, with that, I'm going to move right in and uh, turn the panel over to Dora for her opening uh, presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It, that's very good. Um, it, it's, I'm really excited to be here and, uh, and I know I'm going to benefit greatly from our exchange today and I hope I can do the same for you. So um, my charge, is, uh, as Karen indicated, is to take a look back, take a look at what's going on today, and then uh, just peer into the near future and, uh, and determine what's happened, what could have happened, what should have happened, and uh, what do we do now about it. So I'm going to start with a super fast history of detention, uh, it's specific to the United States. Um, and um, simply start by observing that the policy of detaining parents and their children is not new. And uh, I might add that that's not a good practice. Um, and, but it's really important to have a working knowledge of the history of family detention around the world, but certainly here in the United States, um, lest anyone think that it does work well uh, so that we can do something about it. Um, so when I talk about not being new, um, you, if you look back over our history, we had, um, we interred uh, Native American um, families um, some years ago, and then as immigrants came to the country in the early 1900s, they were placed on Ellis and Angel Islands. Um, fast forward to World War I and II, and you had both U.S. citizen families as well as immigrants um, being uh, interred during World War I and II. Uh, and then after that, of course, you've had a number of Cuban and Haitian families 
being held in facilities in Florida and even today at, uh, at Gitmo. Um, the most recent and, and relevant, perhaps, of the, of the detention practices came about in the 1980s when a number of refugees from Cuba, from Haiti, and Central America, many of them seeking asylum, uh, included in accompanied and, uh, and accompanied uh, children. <laughs> and by and large, the practice at the time was, uh, was uh, fairly moderate. Um, we generally released children to a parent or to a legal guardian. But where there was no one to place the children, then they were held in detention facilities and in tent shelters. Now, in 1996, and Congress pops in at a, at a number of points in this in this story, um, Congress uh, made a significant effort to harden immigration law, and uh, many of those practices adversely impacted families. Uh, and that included uh, a focus on expedited removals as well as an expansion of categories of individuals that were subject to mandatory detention. Uh, in 1997, there was a landmark piece of lit litigation which continues to play a prominent role today, and that's the Flores, at that time, Flores v. Nice. And it was a large uh, lawsuit regarding the, uh, the rights of unaccompanied uh, children in immigration custody. And uh, the holding uh, in that case um, continued to be revisited, as you'll hear shortly, is that the government uh, had a responsibility to place minors in the least restrictive setting while waiting a determination of removal or relief. And, uh, and so that meant that, by and large, that the release was to be of the children with their, uh, with their parents uh, whenever possible, and when that was not feasible, to place them in foster homes or licensed age-appropriate facilities. And that's something you're going to hear uh, more about. Continuing to fast forward, it was in March of 2001, still ICE not yet, I'm sorry, still INS, uh, DHS not having been established yet, INS uh, contracted with Berks County, Pennsylvania, uh, and converted a county-owned and operated nursing home into what was then an 84-bed uh, family residential um, facility. Uh, the goal was to temporarily detain families together uh, in a kinder, gentler environment uh, pending uh, determinations. Fast forward to uh, September 9, uh, uh, September 11 of 2000. Uh, uh, one, and uh, the government again doubled down on immigration law enforcement, further fortifying both family detention amongst its uh, other measures. Uh, and, um, and at that time, uh, we saw some uh, marked practices. There was uh, expanded expedited removal proceedings uh, and, again, um, relying heavily on detention as the preferred um, um, uh, process for managing one another. Um, it was um, uh, also at that time that DHS was created and the responsibility for unaccompanied minors being transferred over to Health and Human Services, a division within it, um, Office of, Ref of uh, Refugee Resettlement. Um, now, it took a little while for Congress to, um, to, to pay some notice to uh, the impact of these, of these um, growing practices. Um, but it was in 2005 that the House Appropriations Committee um, first um, um, gave direction to DHS um, to basically cease and desist its prior practices and revert back to the guidance provided in um, Flores. Um, but DHS did not do that. Uh, and in fact, it redoubled its, um, uh, its, its secure capacity uh, and began to detain more and more families. In May of 2006, it opened a second, a much larger facility, a former medium security prison for adult males in um, Hutto, Texas, excuse me, in Taylor, Texas, called the T. Don, uh, T. Don Hutto Family Residential Facility. Uh, and it didn't take Congress very long to determine that um, both versions of family detention, Burks as well, and particularly Hutto, um, had failed to provide children with that least restrictive setting that had again been um, drafted in, um, uh, in the Flores matter. In 2007, the ACLU, um, uh, joined by others, challenged ICE enforcement practices, and, uh, uh, and they um, were um, 
six, fairly successful. Uh, and just a couple months later, of August of 2007, ICE entered into a settlement agreement with the plaintiffs, pledging in part that um, Hutto would be used as a place of last resort, that they would include the physical plant, the policies and procedures, so that they were less prison-like, because let us not forget that those individuals in civil proceedings uh, are not, uh, are not uh, part of the criminal justice system and de detention to the extent that it is required, when it is required, is never supposed to be punitive. And let me say that again, it is not supposed to be punitive. It is a place where people are held pending a determination of either eligibility for removal or release. Do you think I feel strongly about that? <laughs> All right. So um, in 2007, following, again, the, uh, the most recent acquiescence to, uh, to the weight of Flores, um, ICE promulgated family residential standards, but again, very consistent with its past practices and, and lacking uh, uh, expertise within its own organization to do anything really other than enforcement. It looked back to the corrections model and uh, largely adopted adult um, pretrial detention standards um, for family residential facilities. It afforded some input to advocates and others, but at the end of the day, for all intents and purposes, you're looking at adult um, criminal detention standards when you look at the family residential standards that are still uh, in place at this time. Um, there are some other infirmities with that, but for the sake of time, I'll skip over that for the moment. Now, it wasn't too much later um, that, um, that the uh, President Obama took office, and then, uh, as Karen kindly noted, um, very early on, Secretary Napolitano um, um, tapped me to be senior advisor to make a comprehensive study of current ICE detention practices um, and look for ways to shift uh, activities more to a community-based um, strategy when, in fact, any supervision at all would be, um, would be needed. Amongst the first of many measures that were uh, undertaken was to go back to Hutto and to remove all of the families that had been placed there, um, uh, redistribute them to the street to the greatest extent possible and where that was not feasible, largely because of the mandatory detention requirement, then to, um, uh, to transfer them to, um, to Burks. It was uh, not too much later in uh, October of 2009 that my report completed was released to, um, to the public and um, and amongst uh, its major findings, and I'm going to tailor those findings specific again to family residential facilities, is that um, at all times the government should um, deter should um, proceed as as if the likelihood of eligibility for relief um, exists, and that there be always in place a presumption of release to the community as the rule and not as the exception. And then there were a number of parameters about that, um, objective risk assessments and other sorts of things so as to guide uh, ICE in good decision making. It went on to, to hold that where detention is required, that there be clear standards of care established with informed provi pros provisions for special populations in particular. And those special populations, of course, included um, moms and dads with their minor children. Uh, asylum seekers <coughs> as well as um, others. It was equally important that the detained population have meaningful access to legal materials and, uh, and to counsel to inform decision making. And that, um, that the ultimate exhortation to ICE and indeed to all of DHS is that, um, that if, if uh, DHS is nothing else, it's about emergency uh, preparedness and planning and recognizing, as I've indicated, that influxes in population can, had, arise, uh, had arisen over the course of the history of the United States and had every indication that they would continue to arise, that, uh, that it was critical that ICE put in place adequate planning and preparation so as to respond with something other than detention uh, when the next influx was to, um, to arrive. Um, so, Okay, so um, just real fast forward about the, the growth of detention because uh, unfortunately, while some of the measures that were proposed in that report were adopted, there were any number that were not. 
Um, so ICE moved um, to a larger facility on the grounds of the, of the county um, facility in 2002. It quickly filled up with the most recent surge of families um, seeking relief here in the United States starting the summer of 2014. And most recently, um, the state of Pennsylvania has revisited the practices of Berks County and have determined that, in fact, the county does not have the authority to license the facility as a family residential facility. Uh, and in the next couple weeks, um, some uh, determination is uh, supposed to occur there. Um, the other, other things that have happened in the world of detention, few, uh, if any, good, is um, that ICE opened a 672-bed facility, again, specifically for families, the Artesia Family Detention Facility uh, in New Mexico, way in the, in the, tucked in the corner of the state. Uh, and its intent was to stage families there for expedited removal. Um, Artesia was one of a number of ICE efforts that caught the attention, uh, largely negative, from the advocates. and. Um, uh, and there were a number of problems there, and um, it wasn't very long um, before ICE closed the facility, not uh, admitting any, uh, any failure in planning, but just acknowledging that, uh, the, that the numbers uh, uh, admit, uh, being entered into the United States had deceased or, or, had, or had slowed down. Um, there was more um, that was added in August of 2014. Um, DHS again began to uh, assign families to a 532-bed uh, county facility in Carnes, Texas. Uh, uh, and you'll see a lot of, we can double back to some questions, there's, uh, there's a lot of focus on, on privatization and, and private operation of ICE facilities. But let me be clear, county governments um, do not have clean hands in this process either. And it's really about who has the expertise and who has the oversight and what kinds of standards and what kinds of sanctions do you have in place so as to ensure the kinds of constitutional conditions that we're all obligated to, uh, to provide. Um, so fast forward a little bit, and uh, ICE opened yet a third facility, this one in, in Dilly, uh, Texas. Capacity, 2,400. 2,400. And, and, uh, and uh, um, um, ICE has most recently adopted uh, a practice um, where they refer in particular to family detention uh, as being trauma-informed. And, and I'm just going to mention in passing um, that you cannot, you cannot open and operate and assign moms, uh, no dads, but moms and their, and their young children to a facility of that size and, and begin to suggest that you are guided by trauma-informed practices. It is an oxymoron um, on its face. Um, so the, the, one of the other things I just wanted to touch on real briefly is in the, in the, in the beginning of the influx of families in, in 2014, um, the, uh, the, the, the president uh, and, and then the, the secretary had referred to, uh, to, the, to the benefit uh, as a policy of uh, um, detention as serving uh, an important deterrent effect. And for those of us who are in the criminal justice world, I think it is well established, long established, that, um, that incarceration is not a deterrent to crime, uh, and it would be difficult to measure if it was, as is the case with prevention. And, um, and indeed, uh, the court has recently uh, held as well that uh, deterrence is, is not uh, a legitimate purpose for um, for utilizing detention in in the civil setting. Again, going back to the fundamental case law, that um, that um, the the civil system is not intended for punishment. It is only deten intended for the purpose of determining removal um, or uh, or relief. Um, it was, as as Karen mentioned, uh, in the throes of this last summer, the ABA Commission on Immigration greatly concerned about the impact on families and children. It took the better part of six months um, to, uh, to produce this document and connect it uh, to you. Not because we wrote it, but because, um, um, because I think it does a much better job than I can do in, in 20 minutes. Um, you know. um, 
So just going going back to the report of 09 and many excellent studies that had followed that and have continued to this day, reports uh, commissioned by uh, by other panel members and many of you in the audience, is that um, that in terms of what should happen next, so specific to the facilities that are currently in place, we would respectfully, we that is the, the, the authors uh, uh, and the members of the commission, uh, recommend uh, to policymakers and decision makers that the, the facilities that I've uh, I iterated to you, that um, that the um, the counties uh, and or the, the private providers um, be put on notice that those facility that the contracts for those facilities should not be renewed, and that indeed uh, government should aggressively pursue um, alternatives um, which um, are, are largely <coughs> established to be appropriate for the vast majority. Of families and, and certainly for their children uh, who come to us seeking um, seeking safety uh, and a better life. And um, as I said before, um, uh, where detention is necessary, um, that it be more far more in keeping with the model uh, that Congress envisioned when it transferred the responsibility of unaccompanied minors to ORR, that these would be small group homes, that they would be um, shortest amount of time possible, that the licensed facility, um, that the, the policies, the programs, and the physical plant be appropriate, uh, age appropriate uh, for the young people, uh, none of whom had criminal, have criminal records, all of whom um, have indeed experienced all forms of trauma, uh, so as to create for them a safe place um, to be uh, until those determinations can be stop for the moment, but I look forward to and any questions that you're going to cover us with. Excellent. Thanks, Dora, and thanks for such an effort to stay tight on the time. And we do look forward to more of your questions after you hear from everybody else. Um, so, Eleanor, take that as a starting point and tell us uh, what, do you, what do you see in detention and family detention? Um, what are you concerned about? What are your recommendations? Great. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, I want to begin by thanking Karen and Don, um, as well as CMS and Cardozo, for hosting this very important discussion today. I want to apologize to all of you. I've got a little bit of a cold and a cough, so I hope it's not uh, a little bit too distracting as I speak, so please bear with me. Um, U.S. immigration detention policies and practices run afoul of international human rights standards as well as conventions that the United States has promised to abide by in many, many ways. And uh, you know, we, we could spend all day just talking about it, so I'm not going to be able to touch, about, touch on all of those ways. Um, but human rights law does not prohibit the use of migration detention in all circumstances. It does, however, place very significant restrictions on the use of immigration detention. In particular, as we look at the U.S. immigration detention system, a number of serious problems uh, arise. First of all, detention in many cases in the U.S. is mandatory. Rather than based on a real case-by-case -case assessment of the necessity and proportionality of detention in the individual case. That kind of approach is inconsistent with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which the United States is a party to, as well as with the Refugee Convention. A state must also look on a case-by-case -case basis at whether or not there are less restrictive measures that can be used to achieve its objective. And as Dr. Shiro has noted, the, the objective here for government overwhelmingly is to secure some kind of appearance um, and compliance with migration or immigration law outcomes. So there are clearly a range of different tools other than detention uh, but in our system, detention is really the default or automatic tool that migration authorities look to. The ICCPR specifically requires a prompt court review of detention, noticeably absent for many people held in migration detention in the United States. International standards make clear that children should not be detained. That clearly is not the case here in the United States. Many of these, these, these principles, requirements of an individualized assessment, a prompt court review, are the essence of what we think of in this country as due process. 
the theme of today's uh, discussion. Right to counsel, also incredibly important and fundamental. In June 2004, ironically on World Refugee Day, the Obama administration announced a series of steps in order to contend with an increase in unaccompanied children and families at the U.S. southern border, coming from three Central American countries. Instead of adopting an approach that recognized that this was a refugee and refugee-like situation with people running and fleeing from very serious dangers, the response was a law enforcement response and a response designed to send a message, a message of deterrence. That somehow, if we just sent a clear message, people would stop running and trying to save their lives and their children's lives. From the beginning, the administration's response was driven by political considerations and calculations, and as it turns out in the end, miscalculations, rather than by refugee protection and due process. The Department of Homeland Security built new family detention facilities, first in Artesia, New Mexico, then, um, then expanding a facility in Carnes County, Texas, also opening uh, what's known as the Dilly facility, which many of you have probably heard about, in order to send a message. In fact, Secretary Johnson, DHS Secretary Johnson, stood in front of the facilities and made clear to the press and media that these facilities were meant to make clear that this is what would happen to people who came to our country uh, fleeing from Central America. The administration also chose to put many families into expedited removal. Now, for those of you who know a little bit about expedited removal, it's sort of a fast-track process. Uh, it was put as part of the 1996 immigration law. It is uh, required under law at ports of entry in most cases, though there's ways that there's some discretion that can be used. But between ports of entry, which are you know, formal border entry points, um, in the areas where really you think of as Border Patrol having authority, the government for many years did not use expedited removal, and indeed it doesn't have to. But it chose to use expedited removal in the hopes that it could quickly deport a significant number of these families, and uh, because expedited removal bring with it uh, quote-unquote mandatory detention. The Department of Homeland Security held these families for long periods of time in these detention facilities. Three months, six months, nine months, some families were held for over a year. The traumatizing impact on children uh, can't really be overstated. Um, I went to the Artesia facility early on and there were infants being held at the facility. Families who had been held for long periods of time uh, recounted all kinds of impacts on their children after being held for long periods of time. The Department of Homeland Security also started to invoke um, a strategy used by John Ashcroft many years ago with respect to Haitian asylum seekers. It claimed that uh, if a mother and children were released from immigration detention, that release would send a message somehow uh, and they would encourage other families to flee to the United States. So it invoked an old decision of John Ashcroft's in a case involving a Haitian asylum seeker to ask the courts to not release the family, to either deny them release on bond or it would, require, it would request just totally exorbitant bond. Um, it was pretty shocking to see the Obama administration turning to the strategies of John Ashcroft but that's basically what happened in the effort to do anything and everything to keep families in detention and to send a message uh, or attempt to send a message to families who were, were facing grave violence in Central America. Many of these families, of course, were indigent and could not afford to pay bonds, these, kind, these uh, high-level bonds. Families were being asked to pay bonds of 10, 15, 20, sometimes $25,000. Uh, ICE officials were setting bonds regard, you know, without any um, <coughs> recognition of the fact that these families were indigent and could not afford these bonds. So a wonderful pro bono attorneys would try to go into court and argue for released, uh, reduced bond. 
Department of Homeland Security and Department of Justice also uh, rushed families through credible fear processing uh, and unaccompanied children uh, through immigration court proceedings. The pushback against these policies was very strong. Judy is going to talk about the litigation, uh, which made a uh, significant difference. On the ground, local nonprofits who were already stretched jumped in and tried to do everything they could. Uh, groups like RAISIS, nationally, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, as well as the Catholic, Catholic Legal Immigration Network, major law firms like Jones Day and Aiken Gump provided pro bono representation. The CARA Pro Bono Project was formed. Extraordinary volunteers like Karen and Corrine and others uh, jumped in to help. While, not, while there's certainly not enough volunteers to meet this demand, which should be funded by government money, they did an extraordinary job. Um, and they were eyes and ears and really have been uh, the source of much of the information about what is actually going on in these family detention facilities. A massive advocacy effort also geared up, uh, which included groups like ALA, the US, Catholic Com Com the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, Women's Refugee Commission, the ACLU, my organization, Human Rights First, and, and many others. In Washington, uh, we began organizing meetings with the administration on issues of access to counsel facing children and families. The dysfunctions of our immigration system are such that issues relating to access to detention facilities had to be resolved at the, with White House intervention. Um, this is a very dysfunctional system where um, you know, due process and access to justice is severely limited. So where are we now? Um, major factor of the litigation, again, I'm going to leave <laughs> Judy to talk about. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security has taken some steps, prompted uh, primarily by the litigation as well as advocacy, to reduce detention times for families so that we don't see the, high per, high, the same high percentage of families held for three, six, and nine months. Um, DHS has gone so far as to call uh, these facilities now processing centers. Uh, but make no mistake, um, despite the swings uh, and the use of phrases like processing, these are very much detention facilities. While most of the families held in facilities are detained um, under 20 days, in some cases families are rushed through even more quickly, many significant due process problems remain. Families are still being put through expedited removal. Expedited removal, as I mentioned before, is not required in these border areas and was not used for many, many years. And it's not appropriate for families. Medical research has demonstrated that even short periods of detention can be damaging to children. A number of studies have been conducted that show that even short-term detention really does have a traumatizing effect on children. We brought a couple of uh, medical professionals on a tour that we did of one of the immigration detention facilities, uh, the Burks facility in Pennsylvania. The president-elect of the American Academy of Pediatrics and another leading um, pediatrician who uh, works day in and day out with uh, children from Central American countries in New York City came with us on this tour. And the differences that they notice between the population that you know, they work with in another setting and these children who are held in this facility were significant. And this was after the implementation of these reforms. Um, so that you know, these were children who had been detained uh, not for six, nine, and 12 months, but they'd been detained for several weeks. Uh, in a couple of cases, they'd been detained up to six weeks. Uh, the very fact of being held in immigration detention was traumatizing to these children. ICE officers on the tour told us, well, you know, the parents are not really very engaged with their children. The mothers don't care. They just sit around and watch soap operas. And they didn't recognize that this was actually a symptom of a problem. To the medical professionals, they understood that these families are depressed. Um, these, the children and the parents recounted uh, the trauma that they felt in being held in immigration detention, deprived of their um, freedom but also just having no idea what was going on with their situation, uh, the 
absolute the impact of the lack of counsel and the lack of information on individuals who feel like they could be thrown back to the very same uh, dangers that they have just fled from. They have no information really about the process that they're undergoing. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, as I mentioned, has urged that the Department of Homeland Security stop this practice of holding families in immigration detention. And as Dr. Shiro mentioned, the Berks facilities license, uh, the, the state of Pennsylvania has decided not to renew uh, the license for the Berks facility, though we're waiting a, a, an update soon. So hopefully, um, hopefully that will move ahead and there won't be an attempt to somehow try to keep the facility open for longer. Uh, I, I should probably should say a little bit um, of a word first um, about what these facilities look like, because I don't know how many of you all have been to them. Um, the facilities are very different. The Berks facility in Pennsylvania is actually in a lovely setting. Um, there's playgrounds, uh, bicycles, um, you know, and it, um, it looks like a nursing home. It probably is, I think, a converted nursing home. But as I said, everybody there is, is very well aware that this, it's an actual detention facility. The Artesia facility, some of you uh, probably heard about, this was the first facility hastily created in New Mexico, uh, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, the facility was basically an old, I don't know what, barracks, bar barracks for training or something like that. CBP. Dust everywhere, um, you know, totally unsuitable for children and families, um, and um, yeah, just a terrible, terrible place. Um, <coughs> the Carnes facility in Carnes County, Texas, had initially been um, sort of a model for a uh, facility with better conditions, a facility that would allow a little bit of freedom of movements for adults. Um, but that experiment uh, was uh, retrofitted and uh, the facility instead became a place for detaining families uh, in sort of a very cinder block setting, uh, an institutional setting. Again, you know, there are some playgrounds here and there, but it very much is absolutely a detention center. Um, same thing for the Dilley facility, which I think is actually not that far from some of the places used to uh, inter Japanese Americans uh, during World War II, and it, it gives you very much almost the feeling of an internment camp, though different areas have names like Toad, and I forget the, the little, um, the names there's of the giraffe, areas. Giraffe. Giraffe, yeah, and I, I think partly, you know, with the idea of, of children knowing what area they come from in case they get lost, but, um, but you know, still very much a detention center. Um, back to the where we are now, uh, we now have a, um, auto, uh, in addition to families being uh, brought to immigration detention, family, some families are actually released from the border automatically on ankle bracelets. And some of you may be working with families or seeing families with these ankle monitors on them. So, you know, ankle monitors are, um, you know, in one sense, maybe one form of alternative to detention, or you could call them a form of detention in and of themselves. Um, but they're certainly not supposed to be used in the way that the U.S. government is using them right now. Um, certainly, you know, it may be preferable for families to be released on an ankle monitor rather than being in a detention facility. But a, a, an onerous measure like an ankle bracelet is only supposed to be used after an individualized assessment that there isn't some other kind of tool that can be used to achieve the result that the government wants. Um, and the result that the government wants is to assure compliance. Um, there are many other uh, forms of alternatives to detention that can be used. There are very effective community-based alternative programs that can be used. Um, many studies have documented that um, community-based case management systems secure results and lead to appearance by individuals. Um, they are incredibly effective. But still, there seems to be a desire, uh, whether it's just an inability to manage uh, a system like that, or um, perhaps more likely, a desire to be using some kind of a tool that looks punitive or looks as though it's somehow sending a message. Um, that is the system that we have right now, um, one of either detention or automatic ankle bracelets. 
um, in many, in most cases. Um, I guess the only bright side, and this is going to sound, um, uh, I guess, slightly sarcastic, is that I think for the first time we actually see alternatives to detention um, in the form of ankle bracelets, if indeed you define an ankle bracelet as an alternative to detention, being used to actually get people out of immigration detention. Um, so uh, now we have this very disturbing phenomena of families, um, on the positive side, of course, being released from immigration detention quickly, um, but being released on ankle bracelets, um, but without being allowed to first concur, uh, um, confer with their lawyers to decide if they might want to pursue release uh, through a custody determination hearing or a bond hearing uh, without having this intrusive ankle bracelet on them. Um, instead, um, ICE is rushing to quickly get the ankle bracelets on people and to get people out. Um, you know, an ankle bracelet may not sound like a big deal, uh, but it is for many families. Um, many these things actually have to be charged for like two hours a day. We had a client like break her foot getting in and out of the shower with the ankle bracelet. They are incredibly intrusive. They look punitive. Um, you know, these mothers feel like their children feel like they're criminals. They feel like they're criminals if they're anywhere with a warm climate. And many of these families are in LA or Texas. Um, you know, unless you're wearing long pants, they're perfectly visible. Sometimes they malfunction. Um, so. <laughs> so um, the current the current approach to the use of um, ankle bracelets is is highly highly uh, problematic. We have overwhelmingly right now a huge waste of government resources. Government is pushing families through the expedited removal and credible fear processes, uh, diverting the time of asylum officers who from the affirmative asylum process all in an effort to try to really sort of send a message and at least have some families that hopefully don't pass the credible fear process and can then be uh, quickly deported. But um, after an initial phase where the credible fear grant rates dropped um, following um, a lot of, I guess, very strong government rhetoric, uh, after more representation and advocacy, the credible fear grant rates started to get where they should be. Um, and they rose again. Uh, because, in fact, the credible fear process is supposed to be a screening process to determine whether or not someone might have a, pos a significant possibility of establishing eligibility for asylum. Any of you who have handled uh, many of the Central American cases, well, any of you who have handled an asylum case know how incredibly important legal counsel is in terms of representing an individual. It's a very complicated statute. Our Congress has made the law more and more complicated each year, adding additional requirements and exceptions. Um, in addition, these, um, the cases from Central America involve many of the more complicated aspects of our law. So in addition to all of the factual issues, we have tremendous, uh, tremendous legal issues involved. It's simply impossible for a person to represent themselves in the asylum process before an immigration judge on a complicated case or just about any case without legal representation. Many of these families continue to be unrepresented today. The CARA project, Raises and others, ALA are provide, doing an extraordinary job at these two family detention centers, but they cannot represent them all. For those who do get released, uh, their release options are even um, more challenging. Um, there have been a barrage of barriers that these families face on the front lines uh, and that attorneys face on the front lines. Uh, many of these issues I mentioned before have had to be resolved at very high levels of government. For many, um, this lack of, of counsel is, is leading some families uh, who are released from detention to not appear for their hearings. There have been a, a litany of notice problems to many of these families. Some of you, I'm sure, I know of situations, you know, or have helped people who, you know, even though they're here in New York, they're told to appear at an immigration court in Los Angeles or Houston or something like that. There have been a whole lot of problems like that. But without counsel, how does a person navigate that system? And in fact, um, you know, many, many people who are not appearing are being ordered, deported in absentia. And I think maybe later today there'll be a discussion that will touch on the raids a little bit. Um, I, I want to spend a few minutes talking about adult detention because there's been so much uh, attention to family detention in recent, over the last year, that um, there's not really been uh, enough attention, I think, to adult detention. Plus, the, the whole 
messaging of the government that it's okay to hold families in immigration detention, that, you know, due process and fairness and a fair bond hearing and the things that maybe used to be, you know, happen sometimes at least, um, can be thrown out the door in the interests of um, uh, this um, uh, immigration enforcement, border enforcement prioritization, I think it sent a message really that reverberated throughout the detention system and has created additional challenges, has made things even worse, I would say, from a due process and legal counsel perspective uh, for adults held in migration detention. Um, very few asylum seekers have counsel when held in immigration detention in their credible fear interviews. The fact that many of these families have had some representation or, or at least counseling is really extraordinary um, and really something that we're starting to see for the, you know, we've seen over the last year for the first time. The overwhelming majority of people go through the credible fear process in immigration detention without a lawyer. Many people who should pass as a result don't pass. Um, you know, and when credible fear grant rates plummeted uh, last, uh, in 2014, it was a real problem for many people. Um, and uh, here and there, lawyers started getting involved in cases, but many people went through the process unrepresented and were no doubt deported, even though they really should have been given an opportunity to apply for asylum. <laughs> many of the credible fear interviews uh, are conducted by telephone now. Uh, for those of us who were around at the early days of the implementation of expedited removal, the idea that somehow the United States government would be conducting credible fear interviews by telephone with people sitting in little boxes, somehow talking to a voice and a person they couldn't see about the traumas and tortures uh, that they have suffered, it, it, it's really just mind-boggling. Only about 20% of immigration deten uh, detainees secure legal representation. Um, and uh, legal representation really, I think, has become more and more difficult for many to secure, um, partly with you know, more legal providers focused on, on families and children. Um, funding for adult representation is uh, you know, tighter than ever. There are many areas of the country also where there really isn't even limited uh, legal representation. Or where only a handful of nonprofit attorneys go in and out of detention centers that house thousands of people. Um, even in, Cal uh, in, in the Los Angeles area last month, a team of attorneys from our office visited two major detention centers in California. Very few of the people held at those facilities uh, were represented. Uh, by a nonprofit or pro bono counsel because all the local legal providers were completely overstretched. Um, asylum seekers had very limited representation, only a handful uh, were represented. Uh, we met with some asylum seekers held at these facilities who said, were asked why they hadn't appealed their denials of asylum. They seemed to our staff to have, you know, decent asylum claims, and they said, why should we bother? The judges don't believe anyone, and no one has a lawyer, and there's no way to get a lawyer. Um, also, um, in places like Louisiana and in Georgia, there are these huge detention facilities with very few legal resources. Uh, in New York, obviously, we all know how overstretched we are in terms of legal representation, but in other parts of the country, the situation is even more dire. Um, we've worked with um, partner organizations in Louisiana now for two years to secure $15,000 in funding to start a limited bond representation project at one of these detention centers. The Louisiana Bar Foundation then chipped in a little bit and is funding a, a, I think a part-time fellow to help a little bit with this project. This is just to provide a limited bit of representation to some of the thousands of people held at this facility so that they can have a lawyer help them to see if they can get released on bond. There are no resources in, the, in these parts of the country for legal representation. We've been, we found ourselves running around trying to raise money for local groups that are desperate for funding. It's a huge, huge gap. Um, 
one of the things that uh, we've done, um, inspired by Judge Katzman and those of you in New York who've been working together to increase representation through the New York uh, Immigration Representation Study Group, is to try to convene stakeholders uh, in Louisiana and also in Georgia to um, <coughs> try to focus attention on the need to work together collaboratively to increase attention to this huge gap in representation. Um, and that has really been helpful. Um, it has you know, brought together different actors. It has brought together more commitment, more interest in trainings and in volunteers. But without that funding to actually fund staff um, staff to actually mentor pro bono attorneys, staff to actually go into facilities and identify cases, um, representation really cannot move forward. So just a plug about how incredibly important that is. Um, across the country now, another challenge that we're seeing is um, lack of fair release procedures. Bonds, uh, like in the family context, um, exceedingly high for individuals who are indigent. They cannot afford to pay them. We represented uh, represent one asylum seeker who's held in a Houston detention facility. Um, this man is indigent. He's a father. He's got uh, a wife and, and, and a child as well. Um, and he, I, I gave him a $15,000 bond. He cannot pay a $15,000 bond. The judge um, brought it down to 8000 he is indigent. He cannot pay an $8,000 bond. He was able to secure release from detention as a result of a bond fund set up by Raices. This is a person who is indigent. We should not have a system that looks to charity to somehow get someone out of immigration detention. Many of these families, unfortunately, are turning to a, a private company. I don't know if some of you have heard about this. Um, but a private company that is imposing its own uh, ankle shackles on people who can't afford to pay their own bonds. So these people are borrowing money, essentially, from this, I don't know, what, loan shark bond company, what would you call it, that then it puts its own private ankle bracelet on these families. This is a dysfunctional system. If people are indigent, they should not be being asked to pay bonds that they cannot afford to pay. Um, they should be given a reasonable bond that will secure uh, the result that the government wants, which is their appearance at a hearing, um, or they should be released to some kind of other community case management type program. Um, the parole guidance for asylum seekers, some of you may be familiar with it, for asylum seekers who come in at airports and borders. How am I doing? I'm winding down. Yep, okay, good. Um, uh, there is particular parole guidance for asylum seekers, but that guidance, too, we see um, often ignored. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever, um, I've talked to many folks in Texas and California, and I ask, have you had any Somali asylum seekers released on parole? Um, the answer is overwhelmingly no. So there's, you know, I'm sure a nationality-based um, uh, filter as well, a uh, factor to be looked at closely. In terms of recommendations going forward, um, Obviously, there is a need for a massive paradigm shift away from immigration detention towards a migration management approach that respects human rights standards and that is based on a real individualized case, ma case management approach and the provision of counsel. Government-funded le legal counsel is necessary for an individual deprived of their liberty, as well as others as well, of course. In the meantime, while pro bono cannot address the need, nonprofits and volunteers are really essential in terms of helping some people, but also in terms of being advocates and eyes and ears. Without them, we would have no idea what is going on in many of these detention facilities. There must be more private funding in the meantime for legal representation for these families, for families who've been released, um, but also for adults held in immigration detention. And more attention needs to be addressed to underserved areas, Louisiana, Georgia, and many, many others. We also have a huge challenge in Washington, D.C. <laughs> I won't, I won't, <laughs> that, we, I would be here all day if I talked about them, but um, m what many of those challenges are. But, I, you know, a fundamental challenge is that we have many members of Congress and even uh, people, uh, you know, members of our administration and people uh, in immigration enforcement 
who really do view detention not as simply one of a number of tools to be used in certain circumstances to secure the result that the government wants, but instead want detention to be used um, to send a message or want it really to be used in a punitive manner. Um, that is why we have things like the quote unquote Ben mandate, which thankfully is recognized to not be a mandate, but is still fully funded at that uh, level. Um, until we have that paradigm shift, and that's the paradigm shift we need to have, um, we're, we're facing an uphill battle. But uh, with strong legal counsel and uh, principled advocates from uh, across um, the audiences that we have here today, I'm sure uh, that we're moving uh, in the right direction uh, after this uh, last year's very challenging uh, bump. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eleanor. <laughs> That's, you've done an excellent job of raising so many different issues, and I have a list of about 10 questions, but I won't ask them. Um, Judy, having heard all that bad and scary stuff that you know so well, can you tell us what what has happened and what's in the works as uh, ways of challenging them, at least from a litigation perspective. Lead to, leave to the side the policy piece that we'll come back to, but can you talk to us about challenges? I'm going to probably try to limit my remarks to 15 minutes, so we have 15 minutes of questions. Um, right it's good if you can, but okay. I know okay. you have a lot to talk yeah, about, and we can cut the question time and realize that we have a break. Okay. And we have a reception at the end of the day, too. So do take what you need. Um, can you tell me when I'm at 10 minutes? Yes. I'm afraid that I'm just going to yes. and then at 15 minutes. Never. Um, so first of all, I want to thank um, Don and CMS for organizing this, and Cardoza for um, co-sponsoring it. Oh, Mike. I'm thanking people yeah. um, for um, organizing this. And I remember looking at it and seeing, oh, this looks interesting. I wish I had time to go. Um, so, anyway, thank you, um, Karen, for calling me to pitch in at the last minute. Um, I am going to be focusing on litigation, and I will get to family detention litigation, but I wanted to, I, basically what I do is detention litigation, and so I wanted to try to, to, try to provide some of the um, basic context and some of the other detention litigation first. But, but first I wanted to preface my remarks with just uh, to place litigation in a context. I mean, I litigate, but litigation is, is, we do our litigation in tandem with advocacy and in tandem with what people are doing on the ground. I mean, nothing that we do would accomplish anything unless it was, it was in connection with that. So, and in many cases, we don't even look at litigation as our goal is that we're going to get a good decision from a court that's going to solve all this, but we look at it as another way to pressure, along with advocacy, to pressure the administration to change its policies. Um, it used to be that we would look at it as a way to, to pressure Congress to amend the law. Now that's completely dysfunctional. The chance of getting, you know, an amendment that's positive is, is pretty rare. But when I first started litigating mandatory detention in 1998, that was my goal. I never thought that the case was going to end up in the Supreme Court because Congress had actually passed a version of mandatory detention in 1990 and it had been challenged in district courts. All the district courts said it's unconstitutional and Congress amended the statute. They didn't get rid of it completely, but they, but they remedied it. And, and that was our goal. Now that we have a dysfunctional Congress or a Congress that's not ready to, to do that, um, that's no longer our goal, but our goal was to, to say there's a lot of room for the administration to maneuver. They don't have to be enforcing these, these immigration laws the way they are, the detention mandates the way they are. And so our goal when, when the Obama administration came in was to say, hey, you can do this, you can do this. Unfortunately, um, given what's go what was going on in Washington, we didn't really meet with much receptivity. Um, at that point, it's a much longer discussion, but given that the focus was on comprehensive immigration reform, um, the administration was reluctant to do anything that made it seem like it was soft on enforcement. And so immigration detention, it was just like, you know, especially when you were dealing with immigrants with criminal convictions, which is a lot of the people who are subject to mandatory detention, um, was not something they were ready to do. Now we've seen a shift, and it's, it's not even immigrants with criminal convictions. It's people who've crossed the border, families who are fleeing persecution, and they're not ready to do anything on that either. So anyway, that, that's the background. 
um, litigation is in tandem with advocacy and also those efforts of the people on the ground. We couldn't do litigation without those people on the ground. I mean, not only are they responsible for things changing, but I mean, we depend on them. So when it came to family detention and the first family detention lawsuit that we brought, which challenged the conditions at Artesia, we were completely dependent on on what people on the ground were telling us and were documenting and for helping us to get plaintiffs. We went out there and got plaintiffs, but, but what they were doing was, was essential. And um, it was a combination of their efforts, the efforts of advocacy organizations and our litigation that finally led, again, not to a decision. We didn't win a decision in that case. Probably the decision would have been that we lacked jurisdiction, the court lacked jurisdiction over the, over the challenge. but. They, closed, they, they changed their policies and they closed the facility. Now, closing the facility wasn't that great because they opened two other facilities, but, but they, did, they did change their policies and even at the new facilities there were, you know, there were certain improvements. So now I'm going to backtrack a little bit and just provide you with a sense of the context or the framework for the de detention litigation. And essentially, um, all of our detention litigation is based on the fact that we believe that detention is subject to due process constraints. That the due process clause applies to all persons in the United States, and so if you're going to deprive people of their liberty, you have to comply with due process. That's all well and good. I mean, it's true. Um, but I want to tell you a few caveats to that that we deal with in immigration. One is that, and this is where I'm maybe going to be veering into my um, law professor head, but. Um, one of them is that there's something called the plenary power doctrine, which means that courts are very reluctant to interfere with Congress's decisions. The general view is that we defer to Congress's decisions um, in the area of immigration, and so they're very reluctant to declare a congressional statute unconstitutional or to even you know, declare an, ex an executive policy unconstitutional. So that's one thing that we have going against us. The other thing is that immigration proceedings are civil. Um, which means they're not criminal. Deportation is not considered punishment. And on the positive side, as Dora said, this means detention is not supposed to be punitive. Well, that's good. It's not supposed to be punitive. But I remember when I first visited uh, people in detention centers back in 1990, just um, to date myself, and, um, and the people that I saw said, wait a second, I served my time. I, you know, I'm, I'm a lawful permanent resident. I was convicted of this crime, I served by a year or two, but now I'm here. Isn't this double jeopardy? I, I can't be punished twice for the same offense, and I have to say, this isn't punishment. You know, yes, you're in jail. Yes, you may even be in the same jail you were in before. Yes, you're maybe the conditions might be worse, but this isn't punishment. So double jeopardy doesn't apply. This is just regulatory detention pending your removal proceedings. And it's true. It may be worse because you don't even have a deadline. You don't even know you're serving your two years and then it's up. It's just going to go until you are until your case is ended. Um, and and it's even worse now than it was in 1990 because in that time most people at least got bond hearings. And in 1996 the law changed and said that immigrants who are in detention for most for most um, criminal convictions don't even get bond hearings. So you've got people who have no right to appointed counsel, which if they were these same non-citizens when they're in the criminal process have a right to appointed counsel, have a right to a bond hearing, they know that they're, you know, that they're sentenced to a definite period of time. Hopefully they have right to some work release programs or some other things. They may not because they're immigrants. So it's just, this is another thing that we're up against. And the last thing to get probably unduly technical, but I just feel like I have to mention it, is that I say that detention implicates due process. People are deprived of their liberty. But there's this jurisprudence that says if you were stopped coming into the country and stopped at the border, you're not protected by the due process clause. Now, we have different ways of interpreting those decisions and arguing that, of course, people have to still be protected by the due process clause. But there are a, a bunch of, we've got a lot of precedent against a Supreme Court decision saying with respect to an, a, an alien or non-citizen seeking admission at the border, due process is whatever Congress says it is, that the individual doesn't have due process. So, you know, when you're talking about asylum seekers who are stopped at the border and you want to challenge their detention, the first threshold is to say the due process clause even applies to them. Now, fortunately, when we've done our litigation, 
Most of our litigation involves people who've already in the United States. So many of them are lawful permanent residents. Others are people, and I'm doing this thing here because I'm sort of feeling like, here's the border, here's the person who crosses the border, and once they've entered, then they're supposed to have due process, even if they've entered unlawfully. And a lot of the Central Americans who've, who are in detention are people who, who cross the border illegally, and so therefore they should have due process rights. Um, no due process if you go to a border entry point. But, right, right. <laughs> but even there, just to sort of flag this issue, and I'm not going to go into it, we're dealing with, um, with controversy, with um, opposition from um, litigators for the government who are saying, oh, no, those people who crossed the border and have just been here for a few hours, they don't have due process rights. 1996 changed the law, said that someone who crosses the border is still seeking admission. So even though they are physically here, they don't have due process rights. So, so that's another thing that we face. So yes, due process implicates a liberty interest. There are due process constraints, but we have these, these um, issues. The two main cases that I feel like I need to tell you before I move on are, are the two main Supreme Court cases that sort of, sort of reflect these two sides. That one, there are due process constraints on detention, but on the other hand, there are some limits in the area of immigration. And they are the two cases that, that um, Karen referred to that I worked on. One is Zadvidas v. Davis, or Zadvidas v. Davis, which, had to, which was a challenge to indefinite detention. Um, and the other is Demore v. Kim, which was a challenge to um, uh, mandatory detention pending removal proceedings. So indefinite detention involved, and these both stemmed from changes in the 1996 law which was a really um, significant um, turning point in a lot of things. Um, and the 1996 law, it used to be that immigrants who were in the United States and were ordered deported, if they hadn't been deported in six months, they had to be released. It was under conditions of supervision, you know, where they had to report or something, but they had to be released. Congress changed that in 1996, and, it's, and it just replaced it with a law that said, may detain beyond the removal period. So what you ended up having were lots of people, and, and Don wrote about this, they were called lifers, um, people who could not be returned to their, they were ordered deported, they could not be returned because they were stateless or because Cuba wouldn't take them back, Vietnam, we didn't have a repatriation agreement with Vietnam or Cambodia at the time, they were from the former Soviet Union and were stateless, and so these people could just stay in detention literally for life. I mean. They had these little administrative custody reviews that would say, we think you're still dangerous, we're not going to let you go. And people were literally in detention for years. So we brought a lawsuit, I mean a lot, number of people brought lawsuits, but we brought litigation to challenge this and specifically to challenge it on behalf of people who were already in the United States because as I said, they had due process rights. It had always been an issue, or even before 1996 it had been an issue, that those people who were stopped at the border um, could be detained indefinitely, and those were the quote-unquote Mariel Cubans being the largest example, and if they got stuck in detention, then they just sat there. So we, we brought a lawsuit that was challenging it for people who were already in the country. And, you know, we had different challenges. One was procedural. You can't keep on locking people up for years and years and years without giving them meaningful procedures. But also we said, you can't, immigration isn't, the purpose of immigration isn't to, detention isn't to, protect against danger. That's what, this, that's what the criminal justice system is for. The purpose is to effectuate removal. And if you can't effectuate removal, then it's not serving that purpose. So um, in a five to four decision, we won. We won in a, a decision where the, the Supreme Court did not strike down the statute, and that's important because as I said, striking down a statute as unconstitutional is very, very hard for a court to do in the immigration context. But instead, the court said, well, if this statute was construed to mean that people could be detained indefinitely, it would raise a serious constitutional problem. Um, this is what's called the canon of constitutional avoidance, and it has essentially become our Bible as litigators in the area of immigration, because we can't get the courts to, you know, to declare a statute unconstitutional, so instead, we get them to at least recognize this would create a serious constitutional problem. We're not supposed to decide that constitutional problem. If the statute can be construed in such a way to avoid it, we're going to do it. And so here we had a statute that said, may detain beyond the removal period, and the Supreme Court said, 
Well, may detain beyond the removal period is silent as for how long they may detain beyond the removal period. It doesn't say may detain indefinitely beyond the removal period. And so we're going to construe the statute to only authorize detention for a reasonable period of time insofar as removal is reasonably foreseeable. And then the court said for the purpose of administering this and because there used to be a six-month rule, you know, we're going to say six months is the period of time. And after that, then the government has to, you know, has to show that you know, your removal is still significantly likely in the reasonably foreseeable future. Now, in terms of, of the reality of how this has helped people, there's still lots of people in post-final order detention who are detained for way more than six months, and the government says, oh, we're still, it's still foreseeable, we can still get a travel document. I'm not going to get into that. That would be a whole other topic. What's important about this decision is that in finding that there was a serious constitutional problem, it applied to immigration the same due process constraints that apply to all civil detention. And it basically said, this is, the, this is what applies to civil detention, this is what applies to immigration detention, you know, that as detention is prolonged, there has to be a greater justification for it, and it has to be accompanied by procedures. You know, but basically detention needs to bear a reasonable relationship to its purpose, and it has to be accompanied by procedures, procedural safeguards to make sure it's serving that purpose. Past 10 minutes. Okay. Um, let me just switch quickly to the other main case, Demore v. Kim. So that followed Zedvitus. Significantly, when we litigated Demore v. Kim before the Supreme Court, it was after 9 11, whereas the decision in, in Zedvitus was pre 9 11. And um, we were challenging something which should have been a lot easier. It was detention pending removal proceedings. People had not yet been deported. They were lawful permanent residents. They might not end up being found deportable. And all we were asking for was an, a bond hearing, whereas the mandatory detention statute said, no determination of whether you're a danger or flight risk. Your detention is mandatory. And so even the facts of Demore v. Kim were such that you'd think, oh, how could you lose? And we, we won in the circuits, and we won in, in, all, in most of the other circuits where we litigated the issue. Because when an immigration, when the district court declared that he was entitled to a bond hearing, immigration didn't even give him a bond hearing. They just released him on $5,000 bond. So they didn't think he was a danger of flight risk. But still, when we went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court upheld the mandatory detention statute five to four. The important language was, this is, involves plenary power. You know, when you're dealing with non -citizen, deportable non-citizens, um, Congress need not choose the least burdensome means to do this. And that's pretty damning. On the other hand, we've salvaged it more because it was also had a lot of limiting language in it. Even though it said we don't have to do this, it then went along and justified its decision by saying, here's all this evidence that these people are dangerous, here's all this evidence of recidivism, and we're only upholding detention for a brief period of time usually 45 days in 85% in of the cases, and in the other 15%, five and a half months. So it's a brief period of time, and in the case of Demore, he had conceded that he was deportable. So the decision actually upheld mandatory detention for somebody who conceded he was deportable and for a brief period of time. So since that time, we've lit litigated um, the limits of Demore, and we've basically achieved some good precedent that has least has said that mandatory detention has limits, that mandatory detention is supposed to be brief, and once it becomes prolonged, the statute doesn't authorize it. Again, we've said it would raise serious constitutional problems if you could lock up somebody pending proceedings for years, which often happens. And so the four circuits that have ruled on this issue have all held that the statute needs to be construed as authorizing mandatory detention only for a reasonable period of time after which you get a bond here. Now, does it difference about what a reasonable period of time is. And two of the circuits haven't defined a reasonable period of time except to say it's a case-by-case -case approach, and you go to the court, and the court looks at all the factors, which means that pro se detainees have to file habeas corpus petitions in order to challenge that their detentions prolonged. In two circuits, however, the Ninth Circuit and most recently the Second Circuit, the courts adopted a six-month rule, which we had pushed for, which said that um, that at six months, we're going to say that you need to get a bond hearing. And so they construe the statute as authorizing mandatory detention for six months and after that a bond hearing. I'm going to move on to family detention. I just want to say that this issue 
um, looks like it's probably going to go to the Supreme Court. At least the, 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 the Solicitor General's office recently requested an extension in which to request um, a petition for cert of this issue, and so it will probably go to the Supreme Court. And that's, again, this was an issue we had hoped we could get the administration to agree to a reasonable rule on, but um, it seems like that's unlikely. So now I want to turn to family detention, which you've heard a lot about, and I'm just going to focus on the litigation sides of it. Um, as I said, the first litigation we brought was actually less about the detention and more about the procedures that people were subject to at Artesia, that they were like, just being sped through these credible fear hearings. They were denied access to counsel. Um, no decision in that case, but it accomplished its, its purpose of like getting better procedures and shutting down Artesia. The next lawsuit that we filed had to do with the policy that you've heard described, which is the no release policy. Essentially, even though individuals who crossed the border were, you know, and passed a credible fear screening were entitled to bond and entitled to bond hearings before immigration judges, the government took the position we're not setting bond. We're setting no bond on these people. And it was said it was doing that because it wanted to send a deterrent message. Now, fortunately, some of these people, when they went for bond hearings, immigration judges set bonds for them and they, you know, could pay them. But some did, some didn't. Often they were very high and people stayed in detention. And so we challenged that in the district court in DC. And we said that deterrence is not a legitimate purpose, the no release policy. It needs to be an individualized determin determination of danger or flight risk, and the deterrence is not a legitimate purpose, that it violates due process to be detaining people for deterrent purposes. Um, we want a preliminary injunction from the district court judge saying that he thought we were likely to succeed in this, um, and, and then a month or so afterward, the government just said, we, we're gonna, agreeing to this. We're not going to use deterrence anymore. We're not going to use deterrence with regard to anyone in family detention. And so they set high bonds. So they set high bonds. Still, more people got released because they couldn't argue deterrence before the IJs, and so more people got released. The other major litigation, and I think I'm over? Or, yeah, I'm over. No, but just finish. finish the the other major about. litigation is the Flores litigation, <coughs> which Dora re referred to. And this was litigation that was brought in 18, 1986, but settled a settlement or consent decree in 1997 that um, covered minors. Now, there's been a dispute about whether the government claims that the consent decree doesn't apply to accompanied minors, even though the language of the consent decree says minors, and even though there's a number of um, you know other ways it refers to minors who have came with relatives. Still, they're saying the lawsuit itself to find a class of unaccompanied minors, and so that was their first argument. This doesn't, this, this, this settlement doesn't even apply. Even if it does apply, it doesn't justify releasing parents, it only justifies releasing children, and anyway, these facilities are fine, even though Flores said you, you can only be kept in non-secure licensed facilities, these family residen residential centers are fine, and if the court doesn't agree with it, then they also sought modification of the injunction and basically you know, said, if it does apply, we're saying it shouldn't apply because having this now, given the change in circumstances when we have all these families coming, is really hampering our enforcement efforts. Again, really sounding the deterrence bell of saying, you know, if we can't detain, then we're not going to be able to deter. And just to give you a sense of the, the current, uh, the judge rejected all those arguments. She said the decision clearly applies. She said there wasn't a basis for modification. She said these deterrence arguments rested on really shoddy, no evi not evidence. And they've asked for, the government asked for an expedited appeal to the Ninth Circuit, saying this is like essentially the sky is falling. We're seeing increased numbers of, of people coming. And um, they filed their opening brief and the the Flores Council's response to the brief is due um, in a few weeks. More I can say, but I've gone over my time, so that's it. No, um, thank you, Judy. Don, uh, can we go into the break with questions at all? How much time can we take? Okay. All right, so are, are there mics on the floor, or do people have mics? Or Okay, so if people have questions, please step down here to the mic that Rachel just set up, and um, quickly identify yourself, and let's take a couple of questions. Um, while people are coming down, I want to ask um, one to Dora. 
which is um, you spoke about how detention is not supposed to be punitive, and we've had a lot of um, conversation here about um, deterrence as a rationale, and I want to ask you whether the, in, in your view, deterrence as a policy rationale is punitive. Do you see it as punitive when it's not intended to punish the individual who's subject to it? Uh, it may have a punitive impact, but would you put detention as a, a, on a policy basis in the category of a punitive action? I would. Um, and again, going back to the criminal justice arena, which is unfortunately where government has premised most of its policies specific to, to the uh, civil violations, is um, deterrence can be um, uh, of two kinds. It can be specific to the individual where your experience in detention is so unpleasant that you vow to never do the thing that placed you in mm -hmm. detention. And then you also have the broader sense of deterrence, which is you see the impact of deterrence on others and you say, man, I, that could happen to me and I don't want that to happen to me. Again, on the criminal justice side, um, uh, the vast majority of the research has demonstrated that uh, it, is, it is not possible to prove that deterrence really achieves that, that result. Um, if you really don't want to get caught, the theory goes, then you plan extra hard so as to avoid detection, so as to avoid the, the, the punitive um, uh, aftermath. Um, but it's, it's, it's clear that, um, <coughs> that, de that detention, as it is experienced by the civilly detained population, is a very punitive uh, measure. The vast majority of the individuals have no criminal history and those that do, the vast majority of them are not the, of the serious crimes, the UCR, the FBI, UCR, Unified Crime Report types of offenses. And so it troubles me that although um, folks within DHS continue to characterize their enforcement efforts as targeting the worst of the worst, mm -hmm. in fact, um, just immediately after announcing that they were going to focus on recent arrivals to the United States and target first on their priority one, the worst of the worst, never well defined, that it was on New Year's weekend that they targeted first and only um, families with minor children and picked them up in three states and are now putting them through expedited removal. Okay, thank you. Don, are you in line for a question? Okay, I'm going to make Don the last question, and it looks like there's enough people that if we do a minute each, we're going to be past our time. So let's start with Lenny. Uh, doing this fast, the government's not here, but I looked up the um, yearbook for 2014, and in absentia rates went up 39%, um, up to 39%. Sorry, they increased from about 25 And so that's always an argument the government sometimes uses for detention. And I wondered in the litigation if they're trying to use those recent statistics. That's related to the argument. I just wanted to say, in case people don't know, EOIR does allow limited appearance now. So pro bonos or others can just do bond. Let's try to educate the population not to do in absentia. Mm -hmm. But I wondered if it's coming up in the litigation. I mean, it hasn't come up in, in our, I mean, I don't, I didn't see it. Well, look, it comes up in terms of, in Flora's litigation, in terms of saying people don't show up, but there's good responses, as Eleanor said, I mean, for why people aren't showing up, people aren't getting notices, the notices aren't going to the right places, and actually the students at Yale are doing a whole study of this where they're, you know, documenting and collecting data on, mm -hmm. you know, why people didn't show up in their proceedings. So, yeah, you're right, they are using it, and we do have to say these figures don't really mean much. I mean, one of, anyway. Right. Well, I'll say, Lenny, a place where it's going to come up with Jay Johnson saying that after right. this initial round right. of raids, they're not disavowing it, doing for in absentia right. in the future. But although none of this group had in absentia orders, I think we're going to see it in the motions to reopen on in absentia if they expand raids into that population. Yes, Ellen. Thank you. Um, question I'd like to ask each of the panelists is uh, whether they would comment on the use of solitary confinement for civil immigration detainees? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> you know, it, I, I believe it to be wholly inappropriate. Again, when you, in any circumstance, criminal or civil, uh, again, just like detention should be part <coughs> of a continuum, so 
punitive SEG as a response to what should be only unlawful conduct, seriously, you know, serious, dangerous, unlawful conduct you know, within a detention facility is, is what, um, what punitive SEG would be reserved for. But the government's overall overall strategy is not a continuum. It's it's like two points on a plane. You've got detention and you've got um, um, uh, electronic monitoring, and they're both fairly onerous um, penalties. They're they're punitive, both of them in nature, and the same is true for punitive segregation. Um, and um, and it's also lacking in the due process. The theme of today, um, ICE frequently. Um, abrogates its responsibility to provide oversight uh, as to the appropriateness of the penalty as well as the length of the penalty that's imposed and the conditions there are far more um, severe than, than detention which is already as we've all described quite severe. Others on the solitary? Do you One thing add I'll add is that I'm, I'm our, our National Prison Project has done this report on, on the use of segregation and um, and one of our big concerns is the way it's being it's used for mentally disabled individuals. Right. One, one footnote on that, people may or may not have noticed the Washington Post today published an opinion by the president banning solitary confinement for juveniles, the juveniles and also um, rec following the recommendations of the Department of Justice that it be s severely limited uh, for minor transgressions or offenses. And I guess the follow-up would simply be if the panelists could speculate on uh, diff challenge, particular challenges in immigration detention for implementation of that ban and limit. Uh, I'm going to ask that we hold responding to that point till we take the other questions here and see where we are on time. Hi, uh, Teresa Blumenstein with Loretto Community. I was wondering if you could comment more on um, other human rights violations that are occurring within detention centers. I know you spoke a little bit about lack of access to legal counsel and a bit about um, mental health challenges, but perhaps something more on access to education, other forms of health care. Yeah, I mean, I can talk just for a, f a few minutes, um, which I don't have, a few seconds. So um, significant complaints about uh, lack of access to medical attention constantly. Um, people who are traumatized, who don't have access to um, mental health care, people who um, you know are experiencing some kind of physical ailments and don't feel that they're getting uh, the um, the assistance that they need. But um, yeah, I mean, we could go on all day about the, the various uh, challenges in, in immigration detention. So I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. It's in the interest of time. Thank you, Mary Mag. Hi, Mary Meg McCarthy from the National Immigrant Justice Center. Thank you for a great presentation. I, I want to follow up the last two questions, which I think is really important in terms of where we can possibly see some movement in the next year. Um, and, and Dor Dr. Sherrill, you really began this when you were at DHS and looking at conditions of confinement. And, um, you know, I, I, as you said, Judy, we're not going to get rid of mandatory detention. So while people are being detained, how do we make sure that they do have access to health care, that they're not placed in segregation? Um, we've been working with ACLU and DWN looking at the DHS's own inspection reports, which fail to recognize the deaths in immigration detention. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity to figure out how we can really push the administration to improve oversight and monitoring of conditions and hold people accountable for the lack of uh, proper care and treatment for detained right. individuals. And, uh, yeah, I'm, Dora, I'm going to turn to you to start with. The thing I'll observe, Mary Meg, on that too, we all know that the fact of detention and all of the various human rights um, issues that we've talked about have a coercive effect on people's willingness to pursue their claims because if it if detention itself breaks down their willingness or their ability to pursue their proceedings then it's effectively abrogated their rights to pursue whatever form of relief they may have had so Dora yeah I just um, the, the ABA Commission on Immigration um, uh, worked very hard on promulgating standards um, specific to uh, to detention uh, uh, civil side uh, and uh, double back and um, and added uh, standards specific to solitary confinement as well in response to uh, to Ellen's uh, observation. You know, this is going to sound um, 
kind of crazy because I've, I've been arguing that the criminal justice system should not be the model for how we deal with civil violations. Having said that, just to give you some sense about how, how inequitable the conditions are right now uh, between individuals in the civil proceedings versus criminal proceedings, there's so much more case law on the criminal justice side. Um, I, I say this only because, um, because things are so intolerable at this point and have been for some time, that if all that we did is to say that we would not treat someone that we would not treat someone held in a civil proceeding any worse than we treat someone in a in a criminal proceeding, you would immediately markedly improve the conditions of individuals in civil detention. That's a terrible thing to say, but just saying let's let's skip the 50, 75 years of 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 litigation that raised conditions on the criminal side to a certain level and grant those held civilly at least to those same conditions and you would immediately address uh, to some measurable extent the kind of health care that people receive, their right to, uh, to mental health care, uh, and a number of other things. I just add from a human rights perspective, there's an increasing set of guidance recognizing that the very conditions of migration detention uh, that are, you know, basically modeled on, on a criminal justice system um, are penalizing in and of themselves uh, and inconsistent with human rights standards. I just want to clarify one thing, Mary and Meg. We are going to end mandatory detention. <laughs> <laughs> if we don't, if, if we, and if we don't end it, if we don't end it, we're going to at least limit it. I just, I just think that even that goal is just getting bond hearings. I mean, sometimes I just feel like, oh my God, I'm spending all my life just to get bond hearings. Right. So it's like, then you get bond hearings, and then you're back at the place where people get high bonds. And, you know. So I think that I really agree with um, Eleanor about how we have to change the, f the whole framework, you know, that it's not looked at like you need to detain people in order to enforce removal. There's, there's other ways. Detention is not the thing that holds this system together, because as long as it is, and as long as people are making money out of it, which they are, mm -hmm. then we're stuck with it. And the main thing is we need to, you know, stop the reliance on detention. Don. It's a, it's a perfect segue because I wanted to ask about the people who are making money on it. And I, and, um, <coughs> I think, um, what I, I guess I have a two-part question. One is for you, Dora, is this is a very privatized system at this point. I mean, we looked at numbers from a particular night in 2012, I think, most recently. and found, you know, like the super majority of people are in beds that are controlled by, you know, private contractors. And what is the management kind of value add of private contractors and the incentive, I think, is, is my question for even using them. Because I think that they get in the way of kind of the least restrictive types of determinations that we're all in favor of, you know. They're, they They have an answer for things like the Central American refugee crisis. And that answer is a heavy enforcement answer with new detention facilities with, you know, a detention facility of 2,400 people isn't a detention facility. It's a city or something or a camp, you know. And I've, I just feel that this is a big problem. So what I'm trying to figure out is why does DHS use them so liberally? Right. And I'll piggyback not only on the detention facilities but the privatization of the ankle bracelet industry itself and the management of that by private contractors. So, um, um, what used to be um, DRO, Detention Removal Operations now, ERO, Enforcement Removal Operations, this is probably a more accurate description of their, of their focus, it, it is again, they, they lack expertise. I mean, they, the privatization and the reliance on counties both, because I mentioned they are uh, their hands are not clean in this either. Um, came about when when we as a country shifted from catch and release to catch and remove, and uh, needing to have a place to hold them until you remove them. And um, and so you you have as as you heard with family detention these relationships where maybe the county owned the property and then they turn to the management of the private sector which is now an international phenomenon. So the, the largest um, uh, private prison operators in the United States are indeed the largest prison 
private prison operators in uh, around the world. Um, so this is something, unfortunately, that's been transplanted. You know, the, the removal is what they do. That's, I mean, that's, if you're in enforcement, that's the sexy stuff. And, and figuring out what to do people in the process um, was not a place first where they had the opportunity to develop the skills, and then they found someone else willing to take it over. At considerable cost to all of us as taxpayers, I might add, both when it comes to um, the, the beds that are filled, but also this uh, uh, excessive uh, undocumented reliance on uh, electronic monitoring, which is operated by the same corporations that are running the, the, the beds. Um, so it, it, I think that it would be best if there was more separation with, within DHS. Um, where, you know, you've got everyone being judge and jury and jailer um, all bundled together um, within the way DHS operates it. If you had the separation where you had opportunities to acquire skills, so you had individuals with the expertise to make informed decisions and know how to use the tools that have been developed, um, I, I think we would, we would shift um, faster to, uh, to a better situation. I say that with some hesitation because I really don't want to institutionalize those practices right. any more than they are, but we clearly need people who have the expertise to use them correctly. Okay, um, thank you. I'm going to uh, ask everybody to join me in thanking these panelists for their thoughtful presentations.